Uh, sometimes you put together a sermon and you don't really know what to name it. And sometimes you don't know what to name it till you're over done with it. Uh, but, uh, and, and such is kind of the case today. How many of you know what we've been talking about all summer? Faith. Faith, faith, faith. faith. Amen. Is faith something you can live without? Well, we're going to talk about faith again today and probably for the next several Sundays. Uh, but uh, I, I, I titled it Overcoming Faith. Uh, and I think Dennis preached a message on overcoming faith a while back, and I don't think this one's going to be exactly like his. But uh, let's pray before we get going, okay? Father, I thank you for such a great crowd today. I thank you for a great day, Father. I thank you that you are Lord of lords and King of kings, and I thank you that your word is true, Father. It's all true. And I ask you today to just pour your spirit out to help us understand more about your word, more how to have faith, more how to, to love each other, Father. Lord, just show us the things that we need to do to have a successful life, the kind that you want us to have, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So what does overcoming faith look like? Anybody know? Kind of hard. To, huh? Victory. That's what it looks like. It looks like victory. Amen. So how many of you have all the victory that you want? None of us, huh? Well, how many of you think you can have more victory? How many of you think you can have more faith? How many of you want to find out how to have the Bible is truth? But sometimes uh, I've known of people who get focused on a truth or two or three truths, and, and they think they've got the whole picture, but they don't. They haven't connected all of the dots. And we need to look for the dots and be sure we connect them in the right way. The scripture refers to that as rightly dividing the word of truth. And uh, unfortunately, we, we have to work at it. How many of you know you have to work at rightly dividing the word of truth? Right. Yeah. Amen. So look at Hebrews verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 6. Oh, I can read it up there today. It says, uh, but without faith... It's impossible to please him. Him who? Him God. It's impossible to please God without faith. And you, and you might need to think about that just a little bit, you know. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. What's the one thing that pleases God? How you act and, and how you do and whether you're a good Christian and whether you go to church, does that please God? Faith is the thing that pleases God. Jesus said... He said, shall I find so great faith on the earth when I come? Uh, that was said, I think, to the man who, who said, you don't have to come to my house. You can just say the word and it'll be done because I'm a man under authority and I know you are the authority. So all you have to do is speak. You don't have to come. And Jesus said, shall I find such great faith on earth when I return? And, and I want him to find great faith on earth. I want him to find it in us on this earth when he comes back. Uh, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And, and I don't believe that, that enough people really get that part of that verse. Uh, I think that is a dot that, that is not connected as much as it should be. Because if, if you don't believe... And, and that word believe, you know, it should be highlighted up there. Uh, he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he's God, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. What is God anyway? God is love, right? And, and we know what love acts right, don't, like, don't we? So love is going to bless us all the time, and he's going to be a rewarder all the time. Uh, and, and we have to get that if we want to walk in faith. Because if you think God, uh, I, I grew up a major part of my life thinking God was somewhat of a punisher if I didn't exactly act just right. And that is so far from the truth that it's unreal. And, and a lot of us have been, have been taught here and we're getting to understand it. If you're new here and you haven't heard this kind of a message preached, I pray that you won't... Uh, let it, let it scare you off. I pray that you'll let it get you interested more in the scriptures and that you'll dig harder to connect the dots, okay? Um, so without faith, it's impossible to please him. And if you're going to come to God, you've got to know that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. First uh, John 5.
Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten. Uh, you got you to gotta love him. you got to act right towards him. It says, uh, by this we know that we love the children of God and when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome to us. Now, I don't know about y'all, but for a long time in my life, I tried like the Dickens to obey the commandments and I tried with all my might to, to be good and to do right and to obey what God said and obey especially the commandments. And, uh, but it was burdensome to me. I didn't like having to obey everything. There's some things that I like to do that, that you know, weren't in there. And, uh, and, and I worked at it, but it was burdensome. Anybody else been there? Where you tried hard to keep them, but it was burdensome to you? Well, it doesn't have to be burdensome. It's not supposed to be burdensome. You're supposed to be doing it out of joy for what he did for you. You're supposed to be doing it out of, out of uh, uh, gratefulness because of who he is and because of, of the life that he's planned for us and the life that he'll let us live. We just have to keep on keeping on and, they, and we have to learn how to, how to be doing it out of the right motive. Motive uh, is, is everything with God. Uh, and his commandments should not be burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, even our, even our faith. Let's say that again. Uh, and, and this is what overcomes the world, even our faith. Faith overcomes the world. How many of you know that we, we have to fight against the world a little bit? How do you do that? How do you fight against the world? You, you get in the scriptures and you just try to, to, to get to know God better. Most of us don't, I, I don't know, I wish I had some percentages or a way to figure out some percentages, but uh, my experience with just talking to people is, is a lot of us don't, and I, for, for years and years in my life, I didn't know the true nature and character of God. I didn't know that he was a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Uh, I didn't under, had no understanding of that. But as God revealed himself to me and I found it out, then this, this weight went off of my shoulders. And, and just coincidentally, that's about the same time that God said, tell those folks you want to be their pastor. And, and when I did, they, they, they immediately agreed. And I'd been waiting for that for 59 years. So it's important to connect the dots. That's what, the picture I want you to get today. Um, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world but he who believes? What does believe kind of make you think about? Faith? Good. But he has to have faith that Jesus is the Son of God. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. If there's any doubt of that in your mind, it's going to be awful hard for you to walk in faith. Amen? Uh, look at John, uh, 1 John 5, 14. So now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, anything, according to his will, he hears us. How many of you believe that? Do you really? Do you act like it all the time? When you pray, do you expect to get an answer to it? Absolutely. Absolutely. How many times does it happen? How many times do you get the answer just like that? Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. Do you have confidence? You've got to have confidence if it's going to go anywhere, don't you? I have a friend that keeps talking to me about talking positively. And, uh, and I used to do that all the time. And somewhere I graduated off into just a little bit of negativity. And thank goodness there's somebody out there that reminds me. But we have to have confidence. And if you have confidence, you're not going to talk negatively, are you? You're not going to say things that, that don't agree with what God says. 
that, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, do we know that he hears us? Think about it. Think about it. When you pray for something and it doesn't happen right away or it doesn't happen the way you, are you sure he heard you? Sometimes he answers no. That's absolutely right. Are you satisfied when he answers no? Or do you say, well, God, don't you love me anymore? Hello? Well, sometimes he does love you and he loves you enough to say no. How many of you would say yes to your, your child if they wanted to go out in the street and play where their trucks were driving fast? You'd say no, wouldn't you? Well, see, our God knows what's best for us, and he says no sometimes, and sometimes it's more than we want to hear it. But, uh, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked him. Do we know those things? It's easy to say, yeah, well, I know. But do you really know in your knower? Do you have confidence that he's hearing you? Do you have confidence that he's going to answer it? And, and do, you, do you know that he's a rewarder? of those that diligently seek him. And are you diligently seeking him? What does it mean to diligently seek God? Hmm? Spend time with him. Where else do you spend time if you're diligently seeking him? In his word. In his word. You know, Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you, you search the scriptures thinking that you'll find salvation in the scriptures. And he stand. this is a kind of a paraphrase, but it says, and he's standing right before you. And they had these little phylacteries rolled up on their tassels and on their forehead and everything. And they were scriptures about Jesus, the son of God, the savior of the world. And they were searching in the scriptures for the wrong thing. I searched in the scriptures for the wrong thing for years. I searched in the scriptures to teach a, a, a Sunday school class I searched in the scriptures to, uh, to, to study for teaching for a home, a home group that we had for years. I even searched in the scriptures for, for something to preach for years. As an elder, I got to preach every once in a while. And I'd search in the scriptures. He'd give us some notice and I'd study and I'd search in those scriptures. And I was searching for a truth I could teach that would help somebody in their life. But not until I was way up in years did I start searching the scriptures to find out who God is and what he thinks and his nature and character. And that's when I started learning. That's when I started growing. When I didn't just search the scriptures for something for me or something to, to get more from God or something to obey, I searched the scriptures to find out, God, who are you? Who are you? How do you think? You know, uh, the Bible says that the children of Israel knew God's acts. They knew what he did. But Moses knew his ways. And, and you don't know his ways and you don't get to know him real personally unless you connect some more dots. Amen? You've got to connect the dots. And uh, uh, it says, uh, it says, if we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him, if we know he hears us, we know he has the petitions. But see, there, there's not just one thing that we have to know or that we have to believe. How many of you know that? How many of you have a favorite truth out of the Bible? We all do, don't we? Well, sometimes we pay more attention to that than we pay to other truths that we come across. But how many of you know that every truth in the Bible is interconnected with another truth? That's, how, that's the only reason it can all be true is because they're all interconnected. And the more of them we connect together and connect the dots, the more we get to know the living Savior. Amen. The more we get connected with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's our teacher. You're not going to connect the dots without the Holy Spirit. Amen. So you've got to get to know him on a first name basis. And you've got to pay attention to him as well as, as searching the scriptures for truth. But... Uh, uh, there, any of you ever see these puzzles? Or, I, I hadn't thought about them until I was preparing this message for years, but I used to see them. You know, they come in a book or something, and, you, and they got numbers and dots, you know, and you connect the dots, and it makes a picture. Well, I thought about that while I was doing this, and she's going to throw a slide up there to kind of help you remember what that's like. There it is. It's kind of hard to see. 
But uh, anybody know what that is? Huh? A what? A what? Next time you keep your mouth shut longer. <laughs> You're not supposed to be able to tell that right away. I didn't. I had to connect the dots to figure out what it was. Well, show the next one. See, you can connect some of the dots. And if Wayne hadn't told you, I don't think most of you would have known it was an anchor yet, would you? Did all of you recognize it as an anchor right away? Well, y'all are a lot smarter than I am then, but maybe this will help you get to point. And, and after, after that one, these dots were connected kind of in a sequence, you know, from right. And then the next slide, I connected those kind of randomly. And it, you know, now that I've seen it, it does look a little bit like an anchor, but it, it didn't look like an anchor to me until I connected the dots, okay? Are you getting the message? Yes. So anyway, you keep going. Go to the, the, the next to the last slide. They already know what it is. See, when you connect the dots, you know what it is. Well, the same thing is true in the scriptures. The more you connect the dots from truth to truth to truth to truth, the more you get the real picture of who God is, what his nature is, what his character is, what love means, and the more it can have an impact on your life. It can't have an impact on your life. and That's what the scriptures are for, isn't it? To have an impact on your life. Some of us still have some areas where our life needs an impact, don't we? Well, that's how you get it. You get it by connecting the dots and by studying the scriptures to find God's nature and character and find out in doing that, you find out what his purpose for your life is. Do we all understand that? Some of us are still struggling for what's our purpose, aren't we? I feel like I have a purpose somewhere down the road different from this. But I don't know what it is yet, but I'm just waiting on him. Amen? So anyway, go to the one more slide. The bottom, the bottom one. There it is. See, you, you can connect the dots on these. If you can connect the dots on these scriptures today, you're going to come closer to knowing God's nature and character, and you're going to come a lot closer to walking in faith more of the time. I promise you that. And if you try it for a year and it doesn't work, you come see me and I'll refund your money. Amen? It, it works, huh? <laughs> All right, let's go on. Uh, uh, 1 John 5, 18. I probably won't get through with this today, so I hope you all will come back next week. Uh, 1 John 5, 18. We know, I got ahead of her. Okay. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Now, how many of y'all are born of God? How many of you still sin occasionally? Y'all got a dot to connect. <laughs> do, you, do, you know, do you know that the scripture is true? You don't have any question what the scripture is true. You have trouble believing that you don't sin though, don't you? Because you do a lot of things wrong. I know you do. I know some of you. Some of you do a whole lot of things wrong. I won't call any names. But, but that's what it says. It says, uh, it says, whoever's born of God does not sin. But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. How many of you believe that the devil has access to you and he bothers you every once in a while? That's not what the Word says. The Word says if you're born of God, and how many of you are born of God? That's nearly all of us. Amen? It says if you're born of God, you don't sin. But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. So what are we missing there? Verse 19, it says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So, see, you're either with God and born of God, and the wicked one can't touch you, or you're not born of God, and you're under the sway of the world, and the wicked one has access to you. That's black and white, isn't it? I mean, did I miss anything? Verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. Has God given you understanding? 
He has, whether you, you, you think you can just say, come to God, I want Jesus, I want you to be my Savior, and you instantly get understanding, <coughs> or you instantly get the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can guide you in all truth, but you know He can guide you there a lot faster if you get in the Word. And if you get in the Word diligently, and you're seeking to know the nature and character of God, then He can really do business with you, and, and then you can grow, and you can, you can really grow. Amen? Amen. Um, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding that we may know Him who is true. See, that's why He gives you understanding. He wants you to know Him who is true. And He wants you to know the real God and His real character and His real nature. And His real nature is that He wants to bless you with all of His heart. He loves you with all of His heart. He wants to give you good things. But if you think, if you have a wrong picture of Him, He can't do it because you won't receive it. And you'll be, you'll be making mistakes all over the place because you don't know who He is and you don't know how much He loves you. And that's what's wrong with a great portion of our world and even of our churches is they don't get some things and so they don't understand our God. When you understand Him, it changes your relationship. Amen? Uh, that we may know Him who is true and that we are in Him who is true, his, in, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. This is the true God. This is the God you have to get to know that gave you understanding so you could know Him. But you can't just sit on a log and, and stare up at the sky and believe that He's in the trees or something. And, and you, can't, you can't skip through the scriptures looking for something to teach or preach or something that you can recite. You've got to look for the true God. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. See, you can, you can get off into idolatry by, by, by picking up on the wrong things in the Bible. Did you know that? I, I know a lot of people that can't sort out uh, in the Bible when God's talking about the people that are lost and when God's talking about those of us that are saved that are supposed to be knowing His nature and character. And I believe personally that you can get saved and, and never get to know Him well enough to really enjoy your, your Christian life and maybe still go to heaven. But He doesn't want that. He wants you to study to show yourself unproved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. He wants you to rightly divide the Word of God. He, why did He create us? To have fellowship with Him. How can we have fellowship with Him if we never get to know Him? If we never get to know His true nature, His true character, His true caring for us, His true love, His true purpose for our lives. When you step into God's purpose for your life, uh, it's, it's the greatest thing in the world. Because that's what you're made for. How many of you know when you're made to do something and you do it, it's good? Amen? And it feels good. And it works good. And, and not only that, if, if you're doing it for Him, He's doing it through you, then you just have to study some and you just have to listen to Him and you just have to do it and, and, and you have a good time doing it. Amen? I'm having fun preaching this morning. Amen? I just hope y'all are getting it because I want you to get it. Amen. And, and I know some of you have it, but I, I, I know that there's probably several who don't really have it yet. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Do you hear that? How many of you still think, y'all may not even want to answer this, but how many of you still think that there's just some legal law things in God that, that you really have to try to do? You don't have to raise your hand, but whether you know it consciously or not, subconsciously, some of you still think that God's judging you by the law, that, that if you do wrong, there's a penalty. Nobody's going to even admit that. That's okay. I lived that way for a long time. I knew I was saved by grace, but I thought if I wanted God's blessings, I better, I better be good. I better do right. I better work hard. Amen? And so I went up and down like a yo-yo as far as 
as blessings. I mean, I'd be blessed out of my socks and then I'd try harder to be good and then something would happen. And God wasn't doing it. I was doing it because I didn't know him. I didn't trust him all the way. I trusted him as long as I was good, but boy, if I wasn't good, I knew I was in for trouble. Amen? And it isn't true. It isn't true. He loves us. In Romans, it says he takes us out from under the law of sin and death. That's the only way you can be sinless is because he isn't judging you by the law. So if he's not judging you by the law and you go out and, and slap somebody and you don't love your neighbor, what happens? If you're under the law and you do that, what happens? You're in deep trouble because from then on, you've got to keep the whole rest of the law, every jot and tittle, or you go to hell. Do you understand that? If God was judging us by the law as Christians, as born-again believers, and we made one mistake, that would be it. It would be over. You might as well do everything you wanted to do after that because you're going to go to hell just as, just as quick as if you only did one. Do you understand that? Do you believe that? Yeah. It's the truth. It's the absolute gospel truth. And you can enjoy Jesus a whole lot more when you understand that you're not under the law. I wrestled with that. Uh, I know a lot of Christians that go to 1 John 1, 9 and, and where it says, if you're faithful to confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And, and then you go just a few pages over and it says, if you know God, you don't sin. And if you sin, you don't know God. How can that be? Well, I'd wrestled with that question. And, and I, I went back and forth from Hebrews to, to Romans. And if you study those two books, it's very clear that even in the Old Testament, David said, blessed is the man whose sins are not accounted to him. Blessed is the man whose sins are not accounted to him. How can your sins not be accounted to you? We had a, we had a revelation Saturday at our men's breakfast, and <clears throat> some of y'all missed a really good breakfast and a really good teaching, but uh, Jack was talking, and, and uh, he gave a, an example, and he made the statement that, uh, that through all of his trials and all of his messing ups and all of this everything that he knew that God never turned away from him. He never looked away from him just even once. And I was sitting back there at the back and I thought, I thought, well, maybe he kind of did because uh, and I had never thought of it this way. But how many of you know that your sin was on Jesus when he was on the cross? Yes. Your sin, your sin, your sin, your sin, my sin, the sins of the whole world were on Jesus when he was on the cross. Do you believe that? Is that true? Yes. And, and you remember when it said that God couldn't look at him with all that sin on him. God looked away. You remember that? Is that truth? Is that in the Bible? Yes, well, if, Jesus turn, if God turned his face away from Jesus while my sin was on him, can you believe that, that God doesn't see my sin anymore? How can he see my sin if it was all on Jesus and Jesus paid the price, Jesus died and went to hell with my sin? So how can I sin? And the only way that I cannot sin, y'all may be better than me, but the only way I cannot sin is because God, he takes me out from under the law of sin and death when I come to him and accept him as my personal savior. I'm dead to the law. I'm dead to it. I can show you dozens of places in the scriptures where it says you are dead to the law. And you know, Paul said in Romans, he said, he said what then shall we sin because we're not under law? Heavens, no, he said. You know why? Because when you figure out that God's not judging you by the law, when you figure out that he's not this, this taskmaster, this slave keeper, because when you're under the law, you're a slave. Do you know that? Amen. If you're living by the law, you're a slave. You're a slave to the law. And what did I say a while ago? The, uh, the, uh, what did, what did I, where I could say it right. I can't find it, but it's, it's if if you're if you're uh, the the strength of the uh, the strength of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So if you're under the law in any way, shape, or form, you're a slave, and you're not a slave to God. You're not a bond servant to God. You're a slave to sin, and you're a slave to the enemy. Amen. Amen. Are y'all are y'all getting this? Yes. Anybody? Huh? Are any of you learning anything new? I hope so. Because, man, this, 
You know, I've had people tell me, uh, I've preached righteousness ever since we started the church because God showed me this truth just before we started it 16 years ago. But, uh, but I've had people tell me, why don't you quit preaching that righteousness stuff? You know, we've heard that over and over. And, you know, preach something else. And, and I don't know if I've ever said it to anybody, but I always think it. I think, well, you haven't got it yet because if you did, you wouldn't get tired of hearing it. <laughs> Amen? Because I never get tired of hearing it and I never get tired of preaching it because it's true and it's what brought me to life. And God was waiting on me to, to learn that before he could ever let me fulfill what he told me when I was a kid that I was going to be doing. I had to learn that first. Amen. I had to get to know him. Uh, are any of y'all going to come back next week to get the rest of this? I'm going to go a little bit further, but I know I'm not going to finish. I'm only on page, page two of my notes, and, uh, and I've got 10 pages. <laughs> so, amen? Uh, is, is it okay to have fun when you preach? Yes. Uh, this is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Uh, there it is. This, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gave us the victory. Uh, 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. That wasn't very many amens. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Amen. You need to get a hold of that because if you, the more appreciation you get for what God did for you on the cross, giving His only Son to be, to be pierced, to be whipped, to be crucified, the more appreciation you get for that, the more understanding you have of how much God loved us to do that, the closer you're going to understand him and the closer you're going to be to being grateful and to just wanting to serve him out of love because that's what we have to do. We have to serve him out of love. Therefore, the world does not know us because we know him. And it didn't know him, so it's not going to know us. Beloved, now we are the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. How many of you know that? But when we know, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Now, you ought to underline that scripture right there. When, when, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. What does it mean when he's revealed? When he comes back? What about when you just get to know him better? You know, he got revealed to me big time when I put that together that, that I couldn't sin because I'm not under the law. That he, he revealed himself to me then. And, and I'll tell you a secret. If you'd known me then, you'd know I'm a whole lot more like him now than I was then. See? Because when we get to know him and he's revealed to us, every little step that he's revealed because we get in the scriptures and search for him diligently, we change. We become more like him. And, and, and you become more like him about 100,000 times faster than if you go around with this ball and chain on your leg being tied to the law because you think you're under the law. You, you, can't, you can't enjoy. You can't, you can't get to know him any better. You can't have fun. You're just too worried about keeping the law. And even if you're not worried about it consciously, chances are you're worried about it subconsciously if you haven't figured it out yet, if you haven't connected that dot. Uh, but we know that when he's revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What did he say down here? He said, this is the true God. He's given us understanding to know that he's the true God. And when we... Uh, when we see him as he is, you don't have to wait till you go to heaven to see him as he is. We may not can get the full picture. We might, we might 
disintegrate if we got the full picture, but you can get to see who he is and see him as he is through his word. Amen? And everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. You know why? Because when you get to know him as he is, you're automatically doing good. You're automatically, you're, you're, you, either, you either serve righteousness or you serve the law. But if, you, if, if he makes me righteous and all I ever think about is, God, you made me righteous. I'm righteous. I'm righteous. I'm right. God, I'm righteous. And, and you end up acting righteous. You end up acting righteous. How many of you know that you can't train your kids by browbeating them and telling them they're no good? Does it work? If you encourage them and you tell them how smart they are and how pretty they are. I got a little grandson that's over there and, and he's seven years old and he knows who his, he is. His parents talk to him all the time. He talks like a little adult and he's the best kid I've ever known. And it's because they talk to him and I talk to him and I tell him how good he is and how, what a good man he's going to make and stuff like that. That's what God does to us. He made us righteous. He made us righteous. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And knowing that makes me so much easier to just serve righteousness. You serve righteousness. You either serve righteousness or you serve the law and the devil. But if you're worried about the law, you're not going to serve righteousness. You're not. And you're not going to, you're not going to win. I've got to find a place to quit because we've got to do communion. How many of y'all want to do communion today? Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, we, we don't, it says, he, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And, and you know, I can say that another way. I, I don't think we purify ourselves by not committing sin. We purify ourselves by believing that the blood of Jesus purifies us and makes us righteous. When you believe that, you're on the way to getting purified. Amen. I'm going to go one more. 1 John 3, verse 4. Whoever commits sin, a lot of y'all said that was you a while ago. How many of y'all still committing sin? Okay. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And, and you know that he was manifest to take away our sins. Do you know that Jesus was manifest to take away our sins? Well, if he took them away, how can you be committing them? Hello? As Dennis says occasionally, I think I'm preaching better than y'all are hearing. I'll say it again. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that Jesus was manifested to take away sins, and in him there is how much sin? Say it. In him there is no sin. In him there is no sin. Now how many of you are in him? Well then I don't want to ever hear you say again that you've sinned. And, and I'll tell you how I had, you know, I, I had a real bad habit when I learned this of, of 1 John 1, 9. I mean, man, if I came up and stumbled and did something wrong, I'd say, oh God, 1 John 1, 9, I'm confessing my sin, now you cleanse me of all unrighteousness. How many times can you be cleansed of all unrighteousness? If you can be cleansed more than once, then you weren't cleansed of all of it the first time. That scripture was written to, to he, people tell me, that's written to believers, so you're going to sin. That scripture was written to believers, but it was reminding them of how they got saved. And it was reminding them that he cleansed them of all unrighteousness once and for all. Amen? And, and I can show you that different places in the scripture where it stands true. <clears throat> And in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him sins all the time. Are you reading it up there? Whoever sins, whoever sins, whoever abides in him does not sin, and whoever, and whoever sins has, never, has neither seen him or known him. Little children, the devil wants to deceive you from that because if you ever get it, he loses, he loses control of you. And that's the truth. 
Whoever sins has neither seen him or known him. When I saw that scripture, I thought, well, either I've really missed something or I'm in really bad trouble. And I missed something. I missed the fact that he took me out from under the law. He who practices righteousness, how do you practice righteousness? You got to start by knowing that you're righteous. And you got to start by knowing that your righteousness that you commit on your own is filthy rags. And when you figure out that your righteousness at its very best is filthy rags, then you start looking for well, where's righteousness come from? And it comes from the blood of Jesus that washed us, that makes us righteous in his eyes all the time. He puts a white robe on us and it covers all of our sin. It didn't cover it, it took it away. And we're righteous all the time. And then you can serve righteousness. Then you can walk in righteousness. You can know that you're righteous and you can enjoy it. But you can't get proud over it because Jesus did it. He who sins is, for, is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Yeah, give me my hand. But for him, you'd be sinning and going to hell. Amen? But he, he who sins is of the devil, and the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the enemy, of the devil. Whoever is born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. If you're born of God, you're not a sinner. You're going you're gonna to mess up. Paul said, if you're putting to death the deeds of the flesh, you'll live. And that's all we can do is do deeds of the flesh. And sometimes we let our flesh get out of hand and we do deeds of the flesh. And, and, and God's looking at Jesus when he sees me because he can't see any sin on me because I'm not under the law. And if that doesn't change your life, then you need to come see me. And we need to, I need to show you some more scriptures. Amen. I'm going to show you some more if you come back next Sunday. Because I'm only half, I'm not even half done. But we, we need to do communion and I'm anxious to do communion. And uh, I'm going to quit right there. I'm even going to make myself a note so I'll know where I quit. When you get to be 76 years old, you have a little memory problem occasionally. How many of you are still glad you came to church? You sure? How many of you are sinners? I said, how many of you are sinners? Don't forget it, please. The devil will try to take it away from you. But it's the absolute gospel truth. And getting it gets you a lot further along knowing the real God. Amen. So, you know, there may be someone in here that's saying, well, I don't know him. I never even met him. You know, you have to, to meet him to be in the family of God. We call it salvation. Uh, but, but you don't just get salvation because your folks were Christians and because you went to church. You know, if you sit in the garage, you won't become a car. But, uh, and, and if you sit in church, you won't become a Christian. But I just want to give you an opportunity. If there's anyone here who's never trusted Jesus in a personal way and, and therefore is still under the law and you don't want to be under the law, I want to give you an opportunity today to join the Christian family of God and to, to become righteous. Just by just all, all the way you become righteous is you just reach out to Jesus and say, Jesus, I, I like what that guy's saying about that and I want to be part of you and I want you to make me righteous. And if you say that, he'll do it in a heartbeat and you'll become a new creature in Christ Jesus and you'll be a part of the kingdom of God. And all of this stuff we've been talking about today will apply to you. And I just want to ask if there's anybody here who's never, you're not sure if you died tonight that you'd go to hell. You're not sure that you're saved. If you'll raise your hand, I'll lead you in a prayer. We'll, we'll all pray with you. Just simply introducing you to, to Jesus. And you asking him to be your personal Lord and Savior. Anybody want to pray that prayer today? Anybody, anywhere? Well, it looks like we're all saved or we're not ready yet, either one of the two. But I'm trusting we're all saved and just anxious to take communion with our Lord. Amen? Well, I thank you all for letting me preach that today. And I hope you'll come back and hear some more of it next Sunday.
So if somebody will bring up the communion table. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You always can, Ben. This man's like E.F. Hutton. When he talks, you need to listen. That's a long time ago, wasn't it? Well, I actually was listening to this message today. Good message from God. But at the same time, uh, in, my, in my head here, and I believe the Holy Spirit was saying, share it. Share this story. Quick story. And this, this story comes from uh, out of one of our tools that we use in Celebrate Recovery. It's a book called Life's Healing Choices. There was a man that was getting to watch his five-year-old son one afternoon, but he was really wanting to take a nap. He was really wanting to take a nap. Maybe he had heard some cowboy preacher preach a great sermon and he went home and he was really wanting to take a nap, but he was getting to watch his five-year-old son. Yes, five-year-old yes, son sir. kept saying, Daddy, I'm bored. Daddy, I'm bored. The, the dad found a newspaper and it had a picture of the world on it. He thought, hey, I'll get some scissors and cut this up in little pieces, give it to my son, put him down here on the carpet, it's got to take him at least two hours to put the world back together. He's five years old. Does that. Little boy sets down about five minutes. He comes and says, Daddy, got my world put together. He goes, how in the world did you do that? He said, it was easy. He said, on the other side, there was a picture of a person. When I got my person put together, the world looked just fine. When you get these truths that we've been talking about today, when you get them firmly in your, in your brain, in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit, you're going to see the world different and the world's going to see you different. Amen? And even if you're a Christian and, and been a Christian all your life and you haven't gotten these truths, it'll change your life. I promise. So uh, the way we do communion here is uh, we have open communion first, and that means no matter where you go to church, if you're here today and you'd like to share, we're all part of the family of God. And the only requirement for taking communion is that you're part of the family, that you're a child of God. Amen? And so we invite everybody to join us today in taking communion. Okay, that's all right. Uh, we had a thing yesterday at uh, men's breakfast. Uh, I had been having a, a neck ache and a, between my shoulders ache and all the way out to my shoulder. And uh, we prayed over the speaker yesterday and we're having a good fellowship. And, and I was sitting back there through the whole thing and I couldn't hardly be still. It was hurting so bad and I kept wiggling trying to find a place where it didn't hurt and uh, I couldn't find one. And it had been doing that for two or three days off and on. And so I said, hey, you guys pray for me, you know, about this. And they prayed for me. And uh, even while they were praying, I felt the pain subsiding. And, uh, and it's, it tried to come back a time or two a little bit, but, uh, but it never came back full force. And uh, I'm just telling you that to remind you that God does answer prayers about healing sometimes. And it also, it also says where in the scriptures where it talks about uh, communion, it, uh, it tells us about how Jesus took the cup and how he took the, the bread. And, uh, and then in verse 27 uh, in 1 Corinthians, it says, For whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if, you would, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not become condemned with the world. And if I may just tell you what I believe that's saying, is it's not, you know, when in the church I went to, they had us confess our sins, and if we had all against anybody, go, go get right with them before you do it, because you don't want to take it unworthily. 
and, and uh, I bought that for a long time until I found out about the blood of Jesus and what it did for me. But if you're under the blood of Jesus, how can you take communion unworthily? You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So even if you've had some deeds of the flesh, you're not unworthy. That's what we've been learning today. You're not unworthy. You're worthy. But I believe, the revert, I believe what it's talking about is if you're not saved and you come and take communion and, and you don't know what it's all about, you're not judging the body. You're not judging that you're in the body. And so you, it's unworthy if you're doing it and you're lost because it can't mean anything to you. And sooner or later, that can make you sick if you just keep doing it. That's what I think it's saying. But I think the reverse of it is true also. I believe that when we take communion, there's healing in it. If we're taking it as, as a body of Christ and we're part of the body of Christ and we know we're righteous and we know we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of the blood of Jesus that we're fixing to celebrate, I believe there's healing in it. So if you got something going on in your body, uh, let's just, let's just, if you got something you want to, to be healed, let's, let's just raise your hand and let us know. And let's, let's pray as we're doing it and, and ask God for healing through the communion today. Is that okay? Amen. Sometimes well, it's instantaneous and other times it takes a little while. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to pray right now and then we're going to take communion and just see what God does. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for those who, who have issues, who've acknowledged it and who want to be healed, Father. And Lord, I thank you that I believe that there's healing in this communion if we do it knowing that we're righteous and we do it, wanting to, to remember you until you come. That's what you said. Do this to remember me until I come. And we remember the stripes, Father, that you took on your body. This bread represents your body that was broken and torn for us. And so, Lord, we're taking this bread today, believing that those, by the stripes of Jesus we are healed. And we're acknowledging that we want to experience that healing today. We want it to manifest today, Father, even as we do this. So right now... As we eat this bread, Father, we remember your coming. And Jesus prayed over it and he blessed it and then he said, take and eat. And it says in the same way he took the cup and uh, he said, this blood represents, this, this juice represents my blood that was shed. He shed his blood on that cross for us. So that our sin, it's, uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. If he hadn't shed that blood on that cross, we would have our sins all on us and God wouldn't even be able to look at us. But as it is, because of what Jesus did, God sees us just as righteous as his son, Jesus Christ. Once he rose from the dead and had taken care of all of the sins. Amen. Don't ever forget, they were all on him on the cross, so none of them can be attributed to you. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that set us free from the law of sin and death and that gave us life. And we thank you for it. We bless you for it, Father. And we want you to know how much we appreciate you because you let us be part of your family. So we do this remembering you today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Is anybody still glad they came to church? Yeah. Now, how many of you are coming back next week to hear the rest of the story? Please come back. And if you have any questions about this, feel free to talk to me or call me or whatever. So now it says they sang a hymn and they went out. When you're ready, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you ready to Jesus, for a clean drink? Will they love the land? Love the land. Are you washed in the blood of the land? Love you. always been. He was and is and always will be. So he, so he just came so he was just there. He's he, always been He's there. always been there. So he's always been there. Right, right. Because he created the universe now. Because hmm? he created the universe. He created the universe and he created you. He created the heavens so he 
you could live there. That's right. Stand the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Spotless are they white as snow Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb Are you garment spotless are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? How do you know when you've been to a cowboy church? It is on. She turned me off. You got me on, Susie? All right. How do you know when you've been to a cowboy church? Y'all come back now. You hear? Yeah. Hey.